and the bottom line, of course, the, the, the theme here is that, as my father always used to say in all his public discourse, the future of our community, the future of every community before us was education. And each of these earlier groups, many of them quite hostile to us in a way, they were models for us because we knew that the way forward was through education. And both of you are exemplars of that. Judge Reyes, tell us about how you got to Cornell. I mean, this is not a small thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got to Cornell through my freshman year in high school when we went on a school trip through the Future Farmers of America to Cornell University. Uh, Cornell was the, is still the premier uh, uh, agriculture school in the country. Uh, sure. um, and the Future Farmers of America was a uh, vocational agriculture program that I was involved in. And I remember uh, to this day, rolling in on a yellow school bus down uh, Tower Road, uh, which runs through the ag school and thinking to myself, this is college. This is where I want to go. Sure. Didn't know from the Ivy League or any of that. Uh, so I set that goal as a freshman in high school and studied hard and uh, was fortunate enough uh, to progress through the Future Farmers of America to my senior year when I was state president of the, then they had 7,500 members in New York State. Uh, and I put in my application to Cornell uh, and was accepted. Um, and uh, was advised during the application process by many people in my high school to lower my sights a little bit and apply to some other schools just, you know, just to be sure, just so you get into a, a decent school at least. And I remember getting my letter from Cornell because back then, of course, they did everything by letter, not emails like they do nowadays. Um, and the first person I called after I told my mother, of course, the first person I called was my guidance counselor. And so I got in and he's like, to Cornell? I was like, yes. So it was a very, very proud day in my life. Um, so that's, that's how I got to Cornell. And it was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful experience. Very small um, Hispanic community. Uh, uh, it's grown over the years. They now have a, a minor in um, Latino studies, which at the time they didn't even have that. Um, but it was a close knit group of folks and um, it was just a tremendous experience. It's a wonderful school. I had the opportunity to participate in uh, Cornell, what's called the Cornell and Washington program, where I have a, a building in DuPont Circle with dormitories, classrooms, and you spend a semester in Washington taking courses uh, and writing a thesis and, and having some sort of uh, externship. Um, and it was, it was a, just a fabulous program and uh, ended up uh, enjoying it thoroughly. Um, How long? How long was it? It was just a semester. It really could, it really it could be it could yeah. be a year uh, um, uh, and make it even better, but um, it was just, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, developed a, a friendship with someone who became a lifelong friend, one of my best friends. And um, so yeah, it was, it was just, it was a great experience. And I think part of it was, it was the first time I was on my own and, and and you're growing up and experiencing life. Uh, and I just, I, I, I love Cornell. Um, and uh, it's always gonna be part of my heart. My parents insisted on education um, and they showed by example. Um, another thing that changed, I think in the early sixties, especially when the Lyndon Johnson became president was the advent of the war on poverty. 
and a lot of the programs that that brought into what they used to call the inner city, um, especially things like Head Start and English as a second language programs and so on. So my mother took advantage of those programs, one, because it gave her a job in school and she could keep an eye on us. And um, two, she always wanted to be a teacher and it gave her an avenue to go to college and get an education. So when I graduated Yale University, she was graduating from Bronx Community College the same day uh, with a, a, an associate's degree in early childhood education. Um, my father went to school right uh, down the block from the courthouse here to um, George Washington High School. Uh, to hone his skills on uh, electricity, refrigeration, air conditioning, and so on, which then permitted him to get promotions within GSA as an electrician. Um, so it bettered his lot. Um, but my parents lived in those projects until my, until I graduated from college. And then they moved to Park Chester to a, a private home, uh, a three family building in, in, in Park Chester. But there, but, but I, there, there, there are those of us who started in the projects when it was, and I still remember whole families just hanging out and, and <clears throat> looking after everyone else's children, a, a sense of real community that no longer exists in New York City housing. And that's, that's, and that's a real shame. That is a real shame. I, I, I should add that the, the road to Bronx Science wasn't exactly a smooth one. No, uh, because, not only because obviously it's difficult to get in, but it's not smooth for, for everybody in that regard. But, um, the school system was beginning to change somewhat. So they were transitioning from elementary school going from uh, kindergarten was optional, uh, but going up to sixth grade and then junior high school or middle school was sixth, was seventh to ninth grade. And then you went to high school. So I, my, my my group was ending in the elementary school at fifth grade. I got into what was called the SP classes, the special progress classes. So we would skip one year. Um, the idea was you would skip from seventh to ninth grade. But now we were going to start sixth grade in junior high school and then only go up to seventh grade in the junior high school and then they weren't quite sure what was going to happen for ninth grade. Bronx Science and none of the specialized high schools were going to allow a seventh grader to take a test for their school. You had to be either in eighth grade to get into their ninth grade or you had to be in the ninth grade. On top of it, Stuyvesant High School and Brooklyn Tech were all male at the time. Yes. Um, girls could not apply. Bronx Science had been founded in 1938 by the New York City Board of Ed, specifically as an, a boys' school to educate them in math and science. In 1946, it became co-ed. And when I took the exam, I went for one year to Walton High, to um, uh, Morris High School. Uh, I'm oh. sorry, to Taft High School and uh, on 170th Street, um, which was not a fabulous experience. My teachers were great, but the school itself was patrolled by police officers. Really? And the first week that I was there, I encountered a young girl OD'd in the bathroom. So that was sort of the environment of the school at the time. But we had been promised that even though we had to go to Taft High School, 
for that ninth year that we would be able to take the test for the specialized schools. And my mother was an absolute um, lioness in making sure that I was given the opportunity to take the test for science. So I took the test for science and gratefully passed. But when it came time to apply for college, I was completely clueless about the process. I didn't have anybody in my family really to go to to discuss this. And so when my guidance counselor came to me and said, what schools are you applying to? And I said, I guess I'll go to City College. It's free and my parents can't afford college. And he said, oh no, you're not, come with me. And I'm, we're going to talk about some alternatives. And it was through him that I got to um, go to recruitment sessions from different schools, including Radcliffe and Fordham and some other schools. And he turned me on to Aspida as I didn't know about Aspida until that point. And it was at Aspida that there was a recruitment session from three New Yorkers, the only three New Yorkers students at Yale undergrad at the time, a junior, all male, a junior and two freshmen. Um, one of those freshmen became a judge and we got to sit in the same court together as a matter of fact. Um, and, and it was that way that I got recruited to Yale and, and got to Yale. So sometimes these political changes can kind of wreak a little bit of havoc on the kids. And I really do feel for kids nowadays yes. when they start talking about changing the processes and how, how um, the public education system is going to address the needs of children. But I can certainly say that having access to gifted programs was critical to my ultimate ability to get into Bronx science because the, I was reading classics in junior high school. Mm -hmm. and, and that continued through the liberal arts focus at Bronx Science and the advanced placement courses that I was able to take. And I took so many that by my junior year at Yale, I was able to take graduate courses. There's no doubt in my mind that I, 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 I don't think that I would have made it to Yale um, or had gotten into, I got into basically every school I applied to. Um, but I don't think that I would have been able to accomplish that had I not gone to, um, to science and gotten the education that I got. There's no doubt about that um, in my mind. I, I was at Yale between 72 and 76. So the Vietnam War was just beginning to wind down, but it was still an issue. And um, we had, a lot of demonstrations at Yale that went on during the four years that I was there on a variety of things. Um, of course. Demonstrations against Shockley coming to talk about the genetic inferiority of people of color and, right. um, uh, and protests against the war, protests against the CIA, recruiting students at Yale, um, so, so you name it, there were, there were a lot of uh, demonstrations and certainly uh, uh, the students of color raised their concerns with the administration as well. But among the things that I remember about Yale's response, at least to the concerns of the Puerto Rican students, because of course there were the Chicanos on campus um, of Mexican American descent, was that when we went to them and said, you've got to do a better job of recruiting um, Hispanics and recruiting Puerto Ricans and we can help. We are a resource that you are not utilizing because we know where to go get the talent. 
and we're willing to go and go get the talent. So a group of us, including me, had come up with a recruitment plan, uh, which um, in which Aspida played a prominent part because we used Aspida's uh, facilities to attract students from high schools. Um, and we went to, they gave us money to come to New York and we went to neighborhood schools like Morris High School and Taft High School, Evander Childs, um, Eastern District High School in, in Brooklyn. We went all over the city and talked to the kids who were doing really well in those schools to encourage them to apply. And as a result, we had something like between 30, 37 students who wound up from Puerto Rican students who wound up coming in the following year. So we multiplied the number of students by more than three times. And one of the things we told Yale was, we have a vested interest in making sure that the students that we get to apply who want to come here are students who are gonna make it through and graduate and do well. And by, I don't know of any that dropped out and they all became teachers, professors, lawyers, doctors, um, professionals of, of different kinds, but the school was receptive to that. And they were receptive to our involvement. I, I wanted to ask you, Judge, what you recall about um, staying on the academic thing for a minute, what you recall about Columbia College um, oh, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and what was the situation of the Hispanic students there at the time? Well, let me summarize it for you. My class had precisely two Hispanics. <clears throat> Me and the fellow from whom I heard recently by phone, Francisco Lorenzo, known as, of course as Frank Lorenzo. And uh, <clears throat> that was it. He was from Queens, the son of a Spanish hairdresser in Rigo Park. And uh, there I was. But that probably motivated by my attachment to the Casa Hispanica and to the Spanish department, which was a very serious group of literary critics. Columbia University was a center of many of the educational and cultural activities of the Hispanic community. And it, again, the Puerto Rican community and the Hispanic community. And it was perfect in a way I used to think later, because after the war, the, the chairman of the Spanish department of Barnard College was the great Amelia Agostini de del Rio, who was from Yauco, Puerto Rico. She was chairman of the Spanish department at Barnard at a time when Puerto Ricans couldn't imagine going to college, much less that there was this great figure wonderful woman, and her husband, Angel del Rio, I mean, I used to hear this at home. Angel del Rio was the chairman of the Spanish department at Columbia. He was Spanish. They were very famous literary critics, but they were, and there was something called the Casa Hispanica at Columbia. And that was a center for cultural affairs of all kinds, including, uh, Spanish word sarsuelas, which are kind of Spanish uh, opera operettas, and they would put they were, they would put on performances. The faculty, they were an incredible group of people. Uh, the faculty, including also Francisco Garcia Lorca, who was the brother of the great Spanish uh, writer who had been killed during the Spanish Civil War, Federico Garcia Lorca. So even the mere mention of the name Garcia Lorca it was sort of impressive to this group of uh, the bourgeoisie among the, uh, among the Puerto Ricans. But Columbia University was a center 
of, of civic activity uh, of, a, of, of a relatively you know, middle, middle brow, shall we say, but it was, it was important. I'm sorry, I've carried on at great length, and <laughs> but it explains why I went to Columbia College because my parents couldn't imagine any university existed beyond Columbia as a result of this group, or this, this great group of academics. And the fact that Amelia Agostini del Rio was the chairman of the Spanish department at Barnard, oh my God, this is such a big deal. Wonderful woman, by all accounts. So I got to know these people at Barnard College and, and uh, so in a sense, looking back on it, at your suggestion, in a sense, it, it was a way in which I found a connection at the university uh, to my own background. So far, I've, in hearing each of you, I can't help but note the connections, the importance of public jobs, that is jobs for, in the, for the government, public housing, and public education. I mean, those are incredibly three important themes in the lives of each of you. And uh, you both said, and I think quite correctly, it's a very important part of the history of American urban life. Judge, for those communities that are looking to attain successful professional careers today or to achieve um, a level of political involvement, if you will, uh, to assist their, their communities to progress. Um, what, what advice would you give to, to those communities based on everything that you've experienced? Well, I hate to be banal, but, but uh, or fall back on a cliche, but it's been touched on several times in our conversation. And the example of your sister uh, reinforces my view that the two great vehicles for advancement for the Puerto Ricans and for other Hispanics has been service in the armed forces of the United States and generally education. There's no, there's no question, all of whatever achievement or advancement there is in these communities is always the result of, uh, of successful educational uh, uh, advancement. 